Montgomery County, Maryland was all there was between the openly rebelling states and the nation's capital. And the Potomac River left the county especially open to attack. Lincoln sent forces to establish a strong presence all along the river. Their job was to protect Washington as well as to ferret out Southern sympathizers. Everyone was under suspicion. Houses were randomly searched, weapons were seized and people arrested. Suppression of the anti-Union locals was the main objective. In April of 1861, a marshal's office was established at the Rockville County Fairgrounds and people were taken there for questioning. Those fairgrounds were where Richard Montgomery High School sits now. Union troops maintained a presence here throughout the war and it came to be known as Camp Lincoln. Today it is nearly impossible to imagine thousands of Union troops camping on this land in the heart of Rockville, but they did, along with everything they needed, including cooks, medics, horses, and supplies. The disastrous defeat at Bull Run in July of 1861 demoralized the Union. It was clear this war wasn't going to be as quick and simple as originally thought. That summer and fall, as many as 20,000 Union troops moved into strategic spots in Montgomery County. They set up encampments. Life there was hard. Food was scarce, conditions unsanitary, and disease rampant. At the same time, county residents felt threatened by the presence of the federal troops. And looking back over those times, I see that the mental disquietude and anxieties were what wore upon us, far more than did the material discomforts. We simply live from day to day, accepting and meeting conditions as they arose, and thankful every morning that nothing dreadful had happened during the night. Loyal Southerner Virginia Moore was a young wife and mother living on a plantation just about where I'm standing now, on Rockville Pike near Cedar Lane. Given what you see now, it's hard to imagine this as farmland, not to mention Union troops camping on it throughout the war. Like everyone who saw their land occupied, Virginia Moore was unnerved by their presence. And because she supported the South, the distrust went both ways. Mrs. Moore described this encounter with her uninvited guests after they demanded some food. I poured a glass of milk and handed it to one of the men, who took it shyly, turned it about, and looking sideways at me, said, Lady, would you mind tasting it first? <laughs> I laughed and said, Why, of course not. It is good milk. I don't want to poison you, though perhaps I ought to, as you are going to fight my friends. So I drank the milk, and they gladly emptied the pitcher, ate all the cornbread, thanked me, and said, they hoped all the Southern ladies were like me. Encounters like this occurred all over the county, some more hostile than others. But suspicion hung over every move, every conversation. If they qualified, citizens were issued passes in order to move more freely about the county. Federal troops were concentrated mostly along the western border of Montgomery County, the one shared with Virginia the one left vulnerable by the Potomac. Their job was twofold. They were to guard the border and to protect this important transportation link to the city, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Covering a distance of about 184 miles, from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, the CNO Canal included a series of locks, aqueducts, and culverts to accommodate the changing elevations of the river. This engineering marvel had just been completed at the outset of the war. It was a critical transportation link, moving goods to and from the port of Georgetown. The city of Washington depended upon it, which is why Confederates tried to destroy sections of the canal, hoping to cut off supplies the C&O Canal has been preserved by the federal government. It's the longest national park, with nearly four million visitors annually. 
At many spots along the way, you can see places that were touched by the Civil War. This is the recently restored Monocacy Aqueduct. Today, this spot draws hikers and bikers on top and boating enthusiasts below. During the Civil War, it survived at least two known attempts by rebel soldiers to destroy it with explosives. It is very necessary to hold these ferries and protect the canal, for the enemy seems disposed to destroy everything they do not control. And the canal is absolutely necessary to the well-being of this neighborhood, being one of the best small grain districts in the state. It is now suffering for want of means of transportation, and the appearance of troops here has had an excellent effect. Those are the words of Union Colonel Charles P. Stone. In the summer of 1861, he oversaw the encampments all along the Potomac. Samuel T. Magruder owned a 220-acre farm about a half mile from Darnstown on the road to Seneca, our Route 112 today. You can still see the farmhouse behind me. It was here that a Signal Corps school was established. Platforms placed in a chestnut tree supported signalers with flags, also known as semaphores. From there, they sent coded messages to signalers on other high places, like Sugarloaf Mountain. A telegraph station in Poolsville relayed the information along to Washington or Harper's Ferry. Late in October, a division under General Stone set out for Leesburg. Led by Colonel Edward Baker, they ferried across the Potomac around Harrison Island and reached the Virginia shore near some steep cliffs. These particular cliffs are known as Ball's Bluff. A timely Confederate counterattack forced the Federals to retreat over the cliffs and into the river. This was the Battle of Ball's Bluff. More than 700 Union soldiers were captured. Many died trying to escape down the sheer cliffs or to swim in full battle garb. Elijah Veers White, the man born at Stony Castle, saw his military career enhanced that day. White had moved to Loudoun County, Virginia, a few years before the outbreak of war. A Southern sympathizer, he enlisted with Ashby's Confederate cavalry. While home on leave, he volunteered to assist at nearby Ball's Bluff. He helped capture over 300 Union soldiers trapped below the cliffs and was even mentioned by name in after-action reports. Mr. White of Colonel Ashby's cavalry volunteered his services during the day. I never witnessed more coolness and courage than the young man displayed. Being exposed to the heaviest fire of the enemy, he rode in front of a part of the 17th Mississippi, ordering and encouraging the men. Colonel Baker, who had led the Union charge, was killed in the battle. His body was taken to Poolsville, to the home of Frederick Poole, which was serving as Union headquarters at the time. For weeks following the battle, bodies were pulled from the Potomac, some as far downriver as Fort Washington, 50 miles away. Many of the wounded were taken in barges on the canal to a makeshift hospital set up near Edwards Ferry. This is Edwards Ferry today. Located next to Lot 25 along the CNO Canal, it was once the site of a small town. There was a general store, a post office, and a warehouse. The ruins of the 1850 store remain, and the lock house, which was built in 1831, is one of the canal's best preserved. And just up the hill, Professor Thaddeus Lowe established a base of operations for the Federal Army's balloon camp. Weather permitting, Gas-fired balloons ascended to provide a clear view of Confederate activities throughout the surrounding area, including nearby Virginia. Information on those activities was telegraphed back to Washington. As 1861 came to an end, most troops moved north to Frederick for the winter. By the time they returned in the spring of 1862, the war was escalating towards the bloodiest battles ever fought on American soil. 